So I think um, in my talk today, we'll go over some of the questions that came up, I think, after Colin's talk earlier. Um, so obviously, everyone in the room knows this, what's pre-implantation genetic testing, um, testing performed on embryonic DNA in search of specific genetic abnormalities with the goal of determining which embryos to prioritize for transfer in an IVF cycle. So we seem to be changing nomenclature quite often, previously referred to as PGD and or PGS, now categorized into PGTA, PGTSR, and PGTM. So the types again, PGTA screens for chromosomal aneuploidy, um, previously referred to as PGS, PGTSR screens for structural rearrangements, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, for instance, unbalanced translocations, previously referred to as PGD. PGTM screens for monogenic diseases, i.e. single gene disorders, previously also referred to as PGD. So PGTR, looking at the preva um, prevalence of structural rearrangements, in the general population, we see um, re reciprocal translocations about one in 500 individuals, Robertsonian translocations about one in 1,000 individuals, um, inversions, including the ben benign variants, about 1%. Um, there are many known normal variants of inversions, ones that really don't seem to have any reproductive effects and thus don't require PGTSR. About 4.7% of couples with recurrent pregnancy loss, um, defined as two or more miscarriages, include at least one carrier partner. And of those RPL couples with a structural rearrangement, a majority are typically reciprocal or Robertsonian translocations. Um, the remainder of the structural rearrangements found in these couples are mostly inversions and then complex rearrangements. So again, couples wherein at least one partner has a structural rearrangement have a substantially higher risk for miscarriage or having a child with a genetic disorder. So PGTSR can help these couples maximize their chances for a successful pregnancy and healthy live birth. PGTSR utilizing NGS can detect reciprocal or Robertsonian translocations as well as inversions and other complex rearrangements. So our experience with ION ReproSeq PGS kits, we, um, when we opened our lab, started right off the bat with ION Torrent. We really chose it based on the platform and primarily because there's a reduced risk for sample mix-up due to the 96 um, individual barcodes. Our techs really enjoyed the simplification of the lab workflow coming from um, another platform previously and of course reduced noise and artifacts compared to other platforms. I think somebody asked a question in one of the earlier talks, um, and I think it's pretty key to have experienced personnel so that you can determine um, differentiate between noise and something that should be called. We also really enjoy the software um, that Ion Torrent provides, um, not only the automatic detection of the partial chromosome abnormalities and the higher resolution, six megabases, for the standard PGTA, and then, of course, the even higher for the PGTSR. But um, again, the customization of the thresholds for mosaic reporting, we do report mosaicism at our lab. Um, we report the actual percentage that comes off of the software. And then um, we really enjoy the ability to transfer the data directly from the software directly to the report template. So we essentially, we copy and paste it onto the report, and um, that helps prevent any human transcription errors. And then finally, why we went with ION, um, the service and support. So inevitably, you'll have a problem with your hardware and your software, and you'll want someone to be able to help you with that immediately. And we've um, had a great experience thus far. Um, very competitive and reasonable pricing, and then the research collaborations that we have ongoing. I think Colin went over this earlier. The ReproSeq lab workflow um, is fantastic. We run 96 samples per run, um, very rapid processing, standard sample processing regardless of tests, so regardless of whether it's PGTA or PGTSR, um, it's the same sample processing and uh, it moves through very quickly. So again, pre-configured analysis workflows for aneuploidy detection. It can be adjusted based on lab preferences, um, what you are hoping to report. We are, at our lab are extremely transparent. We like to share um, our thresholds and, and whatnot with all of our end users. Um, of course, all of this is based off of our validation outcomes, so we've done extensive validation and um, 
have determined what we want to report off of that and how we want to adjust accordingly. Um, the key features, the plot smoothing, our lab team really, really enjoys. Um, the updated mosaicism analysis to reduce the risk of false positives. And then, um, again, something that Colin touched on earlier, the smaller tile size baselines for smaller event calling, which in this case of PGTSR is extremely important. At sequence 46, our settings, PGTA um, baselines are two megabases versus our PGTSR at um, a half a megabase. So we do want to note here, though, however, that the smaller tile size is not recommended for the standard PGTA workflow because, as you'll see in some of the slides coming up, um, some of the results become too noisy and will lead to false positives. So as you're all probably very familiar, a few sample embryo biopsy profiles, we do uh, make an effort to, um, did when we were discussing the embryo biopsy profiles to make sure that we're um, very clear that they're embryo biopsies and samples and not necessarily the whole embryo. So 46XY and 46XX across the board. Um, a couple samples for the, for aneuploid profiles. Um, in the top one, uh, the gain of eight and the loss, and then um, a triploid 69XXY. Again, noting that in order to call triploidy, you do have to be using the mosaic workflow. Um, otherwise, for example, 69XXY would likely be called as a 46XY because the software rounds um, to the nearest integer. Here's a sample embryo biopsy profile for a mosaic. Um, you can see the 45% gain of chromosome 15. The software calls the copy, copy number. For example, the software here calls this profile 2.45 copies, and then we convert that to the percentage. Here's a sample no call. So in our lab, we call this a failed QC. Um, you can obviously see it's extremely noisy. And so um, oftentimes the labs will rebiopsy these samples and send them back. And then we'll go into some case examples. So the first one being a known structural rearrangement. Um, we had a 31-year-old male patient with a known reciprocal translocation. Their karyotype is there um, on five and seven. A 31-year-old female partner, their clinical history was two miscarriages. So blown up, this is what we were looking at. The arrows indicate the breakpoints for this translocation. And all the segments here were expected to be large, greater than 50 megabases. <clears throat> so the standard PGTA workflow was utilized. So looking at the samples that they sent us, <clears throat> um, there were 18 embryo biopsy samples received. The results, four euploid or balanced samples nine abnormal involving the translocation with or without other abnormalities, five additional abnormal or mosaic samples not involving the translocation. So again, this is the same case. Um, above, you can see the euploid or balanced embryo biopsy sample. And on the bottom portion of the slide, you can see the unbalanced bio embryo biopsy sample um, between five and seven. So next, moving on to another case example. So this is a su uh, suspected structural re rearrangement. So um, this patient came to us, 39-year-old female and a 43-year-old male partner. They had no clinical history other than being um, AMA, advanced maternal age. There were eight embryo biopsy samples received for PGTA, standard PG PGTA, not PGTSR. And so the euplidy rate for um, 38 to 40 year old female at our laboratory between 30 and 35 percent, so we expected to find um, two to three normal samples. However, the results showed that we found no euploid samples. There were four abnormal samples involving the same segments, plus or minus some other abnormalities. And um, on two, we saw something about 22 megabases, and on seven, 15 megabases. And then another two samples where there were abnormal samples involving the same chromosome, two or seven, and two additional abnormal samples involving completely other chromosomes. 
So looking at a couple of the samples, um, embryo biopsy sample number seven, you can see the clear two and the seven. On embryo number 11, um, it was called aneuploid for a partial abnormality of chromosome two and nothing on seven. So because of the high number of um, abnormalities that we saw that were all the same, we reanalyzed all of the samples on the PGT-SR high resolution workflow. And the results came back that we had no U-plate samples. Um, six of the samples had the same segment, abnormal, same segments. Um, and then two additional abnormal samples involving other chromosomes. Um, the two embryos that were called only called to have a partial abnormality on chromosome two or seven were now called aneuploid for both, um, for a total of six unbalanced embryos. So again, looking at the changes when we went from the PGTA to the PGTSR workflow, um, you can see this is the one that had the, that, that did not call the chromosome seven um, previously. And then now below with the PGTSR, workflow, it did automatically call the PG, uh, the abnormality on the seven. Um, again, it's important to note here, you can see how much noisier um, the PGT-SR workflow is because of the tile size. And so there were several other random events called, and that's why it's important that we use the higher resolution PGT-SR workflow for SR cases only in order to avoid the false positives. So the PGTSR workflow in this case identified the same abnormal segments in six of the eight embryos. The results reported um, on the report as suspected translocation with a recommendation for karyotypes in both partners. And then upon follow-up, the male partner's karyotype revealed a reciprocal translocation, exactly where we expected it to be. And then finally, the last case that I'll go over is another suspected structural rearrangement, um, this time even smaller. So 36-year-old female patient and a 38-year-old male patient, clinical history of only AMA, again. First cycle, um, three embryo biopsy samples received just for standard PGTA. Euplidy rate expected was 40 to 45%, so we expected one to two normal embryos. And the first cycle results turned out just fine. We saw two euploid samples, one male, one female, and one aneuploid sample, um, male with a partial gain two partial gains. However, this patient came back for a second cycle. They, had, they wanted to bank additional embryos, and this clinic that we work with typically um, has their older patients go through more cycles if they're hoping to have more children. Um, in their second cycle, there were five embryo biopsy samples received for PGTA this time. Um, again, we would expect about two to three normal samples. And the second cycle results, there was one euploid sample that was female, and then four aneuploid samples, all male, with a partial gain. One also had a small partial loss. So we reported these results as suspected Y chromosome structural rearrangement with a recommendation for a karyotype in the male partner. And the couple underwent genetic counseling the following day to review results and discuss possible outcomes of the karyotype and clinical interpretation. And then further internal discussion regarding the Y chromosome abnormality, abnormality led to a reanalysis of all eight embryos from the first and the second cycle with the PGT-SR workflow with special attention to that Y chromosome. So our results show that all the male samples showed the same partial Y chromosome loss and a partial Y chromosome gain. So you'll see here for example, embryo biopsy sample number two from the first couple's first cycle was reported as a euploid male, but upon reanalysis with the PGT-SR workflow, we now see um, the partial loss and the partial gain on chromosome on the Y chromosome, and the same findings for all the other male chrom uh, embryos. Embryo number six from their second cycle was called with um, just a partial Y gain on the PGTA workflow, and now on the PGTSR workflow um, had both the partial loss and the partial gain. So here's what we were looking at. 
And um, the blue section is heterochromatin. This is never covered on NGS. But um, you can see how small the other segments were expected to be. So quite small. So we issued new PGTSR reports for both cycles, indicating that all male embryos appear to have the same Y chromosome related to structural rearrangements. Um, chromosomal micro microarray was recommended for the male partner because the segments were too small to be reliably detected on standard or high resolution karyotype. And the results returned as expected, partial loss and partial gain of chrom the Y chromosome, um, which was actually called a vari variant of unknown significance by the laboratory. Um, so there was a deletion and the duplication, again, even smaller than we had expected. And interestingly, the deletions within this segment can actually lead to male infertility, but duplications have no known cl um, clinical significance. And that is all I have. <laughs>